The Power of the Doctor. The big finale story for Judy Whittaker's 13th Doctor, as well as the departure story for Chris Chibnall as head writer. Now, this episode, it was mad. Completely and utterly mad. And I'm going to say my thoughts on this story ahead of time, just to avoid rambling too much. But I'm pretty much going to ramble with this, because there is so much packed into this episode that it... It really does need to be spoken to piece by piece. So stuff I like, stuff I wish had been focused on a bit more, stuff that could have been focused on a little less, but there will be spoilers ahead for this particular episode. So if you haven't seen it yet, or if you've been, just go off, watch the episode, come back, and then watch this review. Now, my overall thoughts on this particular story, before I get started on specifics, is that I felt that this story... I. I mean, kind of two minds about it. I mean, half of my mind is thinking, okay, I can kind of understand why some people may not like this particular story. I mean, it does have a lot packed into it, and I can understand if they don't necessarily like the writing or if they feel that it's just a bit muddled. It is pretty much a big mess. But the other side of my brain is going, yeah, it's a mess, but it's a fun mess. I mean, when Doctor Who does messes, they're fun messes. And even towards the end, th there are two ways of really going about a Doctor's departure story. You can either go big and bombastic or something a little more slowed down. Like, for example, when Peter Capaldi and Stephen Moffat were leaving the show, they did a last story that was pretty much slowed down. I mean, that was partially because uh, The Doctor Falls was originally supposed to be the last episode for the two of them. But then when Chris Chibnall said he wasn't doing a Christmas special, they crammed in one last go and did something a lot more slowed down. This episode is full on madcap, throwing everything at you every single second. And some of it works, some of it doesn't. But anyway, I'm going to go into spoilers ahead now. Spoiler territory. So if you haven't seen it yet, go off, watch the episode and come back. Because we really need to examine this piece by piece. Okay, to start off with, the Doctor, Yaz and Dan are in the middle of their adventures saving a train from the Cybermasters who are invading the train and are looking for a specific piece of cargo, which is eventually revealed to be a seemingly a child. Anyway, they, they manage, to escape, <coughs> manage to escape, but the Cybermen get the child and escape on their own. They return back to Liverpool, where the Doctor plans to drop Dan off for his date with Diane. And John Bishop's Dan says to her, you don't need to bother coming back for me. He's just like, what? He said, look, I nearly died on that last mission. My helmet got broken, I nearly suffocated, but I've loved my time with you, but Th this is the point where I leave, where I jump off. And she's, and you can see that the Doctor is, like when she lost Graham and Ryan, she's sad that he's leaving, but she seems to understand, but she doesn't want to go too heavily into it. However, Yaz does stay behind briefly to give Dan a hug and wish him all the well on his journey. To which the Doctor then receives a hologram message from a Dalek, warning her that the Daleks are going to be invading Earth. And sends her a set of coordinates to which the Doctor seems suspicious, because she knows this is almost certainly a trap, but even though it's the Doctor, she can't avoid it. To which, when she and Yaz go off to investigate something, they end up finding a mysterious new planet in their in the solar system, and it's got the child that they saw earlier chained up and kind of floating in the air. And it seems to be power in the planet. And there's also another TARDIS there, which has ha 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 on the detailed box. And when when they get back, they realise that this is almost certainly a trap. They've got a lot going on. But then it's also revealed the Cybermasters are on planet keeping watch over everything. But then the Doctor gets a call from Kate Stewart, played once again by Gemma Redgrave asking her for help back on planet Earth. Even the Doctor says, yeah, we're kind of a little busy at the minute, to which, to which Kate goes, no, we really need you. So it brings her back. Now, hold on. One thing I briefly forgot to talk about is uh, Dan Lewis's exit with John Bishop. 
the first of my small little kind of niggles with this particular story is that while they evidently had big plans in this story for the 13th Doctor and Yaz, it didn't really, it seemed to me they didn't really know what to do with Dan Lewis in the story, what to do with John Bishop. Because he's in there at the very start, and he's in, like, at the end in the epilogue, but aside from that, he just vanishes from the story, which I feel was a little bit of a shame. Like, with the ending that they gave him in Legend of the Sea Devils, I was kind of expecting just to maybe see him meet up with Diane and see how things go from there, but, I mean... And that, that, that's a small gripe on my part. Anyway, the Doctor and Yaz go to London where they meet up with Kate, who reintroduces the Doctor to two of her old companions, Ace, played by Sophie Aldred, and Tegan Javanka, played by Janet Fielding. And you can only tell here that they're excited to see the Doctor again, but they're also kind of a little bitter about it. I mean, I... I didn't really get the bitterness for Tegan, which it's implied that Tegan is a little bit angry at the Doctor for the fact that she never saw her again after being dropped off in Resurrection. No, no, yeah, in Resurrection of the Daleks. And I'll be honest, I don't think that made sense because I remember watching Resurrection of the Daleks and Tegan seemed to be left of her, left of her own accord. Like, she just. As she said to the Doctor, my aunt said with air hostessing that uh, she warned me that if it ever stopped being fun to give it up. And that's why I'm leaving you now, because I've loved all this time travel and now it's just not fun anymore. So I didn't really necessarily get why T was so mad at him, like, mad at her. But we finally do get an explanation as to why Ace left the Doctor. Which, I don't know if that's revealed in the Big Finish stuff, which I am slowly working my way through. But, I, I don't know, maybe I'll come to a story where Ace does end up leaving the Doctor in Big Finish. We'll get to that. But it is nice to see them again, and anyway, it's the big thing that they reveal is that several of the world's leading seismologists have seemingly gone missing. That That's scary enough, but also several paintings from around the world, several famous paintings, such as the Mona Lisa and the like, have been seemingly taken down for restoration. Now this might not seem anything too weird, except Ace has been following some of the paintings, so she knows that one of them was only taken down for a routine restoration two months ago. So she doesn't really understand. When they eventually see the paintings, uh, Kate says that they've seemingly been defaced seemingly by Rasputin. However, when the Doctor sees the paintings, she knows it's not Rasputin, as she reveals to them that's the latest incarnation of the Master, played once again by Sasha Dewan, who has, in 1916, assumed the role of Rasputin. Okay, he's managed to manipulate the royalty there, use some of his hypnotic abilities, which it is nice to see, and manage to set up things up. He, he has kidnapped, or rather got the world's leading seismologists and shrunk them down, effectively killing them with his miniaturization tech. So they, they work away, unit captures him and stores him away. However, the Doctor knows there's a lot more going on, as when she goes to investigate a volcano with, where the Dalek was, she ends up eventually ends up being captured by the Daleks and brought to 1916, where the Rasputin version of the Master has a big plan for her. In a reference kind of back to the second Doctor Regeneration story, The War Games, as well as uh, the Doctor Who movie from 1996, the Master effectively plans to steal the Doctor's body. Like, he wants to steal the Doctor's body so he can become the Doctor and thus, in the process, take over the universe and put the Doctor's name to shame. And he plans to do this by forcing her regeneration, to which he manages to do so and briefly, and using technology from the Cybermen and the Daleks who he's allied himself with, he, he manages to assume the role of to take control of the Doctor's body with the Doctor now effectively being played by Sasha the One. And you can tell that this episode is written 
mainly with Sasha Dawn in mind, as it, it allows him an opportunity to go full camp. And in fairness, Sasha Dawn's master, he does camp very, very well. You can see him completely owning the screen every time he's on it, and he absolutely loves it. But that's not the only phase of the Master's plan. Not only did he plan to steal the Doctor's body, but back in 2022, he one of the things that Tegan was a bit kind of mad at the Doctor about was seemingly that she had been sent a small kind of doll of a Cyberman, which she didn't really understand that she was a bit angry about because the Cybermen don't exactly hold good memories for her. As pointed out later, she remembers Adric, and his death with that. But it turns out it wasn't the Doctor who sent the doll, it was the Master. As he could, as it effectively was a Russian doll, which is apparently what it came to her in, and he plans to, he basically re enlarged it, allowing the Cybermen, including Ashad from the Timeless Children, to come out and start to take over Unit Base. To which it's up to essentially Ace, Tegan, and Kate to try and find a way out of there. Which is nice to see. Now, the other two characters who do pop up in this story that I do quickly want to mention is that at one point Ace ends up in the volcano and she ends up running into Graham. Played once again by Bradley Walsh. To which I saw his name on the cast list and I knew he was coming back and... To my mind, it was either going to be they were going to find a way to slot him into the story, or it was going to be like what they did with the twelfth Doctor or the or the fifth Doctor, or the like which is that at the end they'd have kind of a selection of clips of the Doctor's former companions, and maybe he would be one of the visions that the Doctor sees. But they did actually manage to work him into the story fairly well. He tries to use the psychic paper on Ace to kind of explain, oh, um, I'm here kind of inspecting the volcano, to which he looks at it and goes, you're growing up, Brian, you're a friend of the Doctor. What? You really need to learn how to use that properly. I can, I can never get this right. Which, I don't know, it's nice to see him back. When, when Yaz ends up meeting him later and asking, well... Well, when Yaz and the Doctor end up meeting him later and asking, Hey, where's Ryan? And he goes, Oh, Patagonia. To which, I'll admit, I, I wish they had got Toast and Cole back for the final episode, but maybe scheduling wouldn't allow that. But you, you know what? It, it's still... It, it's okay. I mean, they they managed to get Bradley Walsh back. I'll accept that. And the last character who kind of shows up here, who's mainly part of the story, is Instant V Vinder. Played once again by Jacob Anderson. He ends up crashing onto the Cyberman's planet, and when the Master ends up taking over the Doctor's body, he ends up meeting... Uh, Vinda ends up meeting back up with Yaz as they try and figure out a way to set things right and get things back to normal. Meanwhile, inside the Doctor... Meanwhile, when the Master takes over the Doctor's body, the Doctor's own consciousness seemingly finds herself in a mysterious land above a cliff where she ends up talking to seemingly, I don't know, kind of vision versions of previous versions of herself, with the first Doctor being played by David Bradley. Once again, I didn't know he'd ever come back, so I was glad to see him here. The fifth Doctor, played once again by Peter Davison. The sixth Doctor, played by Colin Baker. And the, se the seventh Doctor, played by Sylvester McCoy. And the eighth Doctor, played by Paul McGann. Just, she sees visions of these telling her that there is a way back. But then, they're gonna, but then she's going to have to approach the edge of regeneration. And the mount... And it... it I, I honestly was in shock that they managed to get all of these people back to play the Doctor. I mean, I was watching this and thinking, oh, okay, yeah, I, I, I like this. This is mad, but it works. It's also revealed that earlier on in the story, as the Doctor touched Yaz, Ace, and Tegan, she seemingly got static from them, which is eventually revealed to be some kind of holographic implant that's implanted under their skin which allows them, even when the Master is taken over the Doctor's body, it allows an AI hologram is able to communicate with them and reassure them that everything is going to be all right. With the 13th Doctor, i.e. Jodie, talking to Yaz, uh, 
the fifth doctor played by peter davison talking to tegan and the seventh doctor play, played by sylvester mccoy talking to ace to which it's revealed as to why Ace ultimately left the Doctor, and that they had a bit of an argument, which I gather is supposed to be about when it's appropriate to use destructive force, which Ace admitting that she left the Doctor because she had always used destructive force and she always felt that it was necessary, to which she points out there are times when uh, I don't want to use it, but destructive force is necessary. And I did miss you. Which it is nice to see. Also, all of these actors, when they're with their respective doctors, they just slip back into it like that. I mean, you can see early on when Tegan is talking to the 13th Doctor that she's not necessarily comfortable about the whole thing. But then when she's talking to Peter Davison's Doctor, both of them, you know that they had chemistry and they work together and it's just brilliant. Now, the Master and the Daleks and the Cybermasters ultimate plan is they've tapped into the Earth tectonic plates. They plan to use these to activate volcanoes around the world and essentially destroy Earth and use cyber technology to take it over and make it a cyber factory. And it, it, it ultimately gets a little bit complicated. But then when they ultimately do sort things out, that, once again, one small thing that I did feel was a little mm, meh, or a little kind of questionable as to how survivable actually was that, is when Tegan and uh, Kate finally do manage to escape Unit HQ after it seemingly been destroyed, there was a point where I was just like, yeah, but even the crashing building, you would not be able to survive that standing so close. I mean, just the force of it, that, 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 I, I feel, I felt my suspension of disbelief was being pushed a little bit there, but it, they still do provide some great comedy moments as well, like, when the Doctor, well, well, I, I guess first I need to kind of explain about another great scene, where the Master gets brought back to 1916 by Yaz, a, along with, uh, Vinda holding the Master at gunpoint, which while the Master still seemingly assumes he's one, with the AI version of the Doctor then assumes the role of Joe Martin, the fugitive Doctor, who of course the Master doesn't recognise, just like, who are you? To which, when he, try, when he gets his Cybermen to try and shoot her, it seemingly has no effect, but because it's an AI hologram, the, the Cybermen end up shooting themselves. However, because they're Cyber Masters, they subsequently begin to regenerate. However, Yaz and Vinda are able to force the Master back inside the, the machine that he did earlier with the Doctor, along with his original body, where they effectively degenerate the Doctor back to the 13th Doctor. Which, I, I don't know, I kind of question the viability of the, all this, but you know what, I'll, I'll accept that. But when the Doctor has managed to get her body back, and it's certainly very cool. I do love that when when they end up meeting back up with everyone, including Tegan, Tegan, who has been kind of cold towards the Doctor, when they finally see her, it's like, yes, I would like to go in the TARDIS. Just, I, I did love that. Even Kate, who I didn't actually realise, hadn't actually stepped inside the Doctor's TARDIS before. Even she seems, even she seems a bit surprised about it, going... Has it always been bigger on the inside, which I never actually realised Kate had stepped inside the TARDIS, which was kind of nice. And everyone working together in order to try and stop the Cybermen, stop the planet, and ultimately work things out, it works pretty well. But then, of course, this is Jodie Whittaker's final episode, and, of course, she has to regenerate. To which, while I thought that maybe the regeneration was still going to happen after they degenerated her back to Jody, and that maybe she was just holding it back. When she ultimately undoes the Master's plan, he says that even if if he if he can't be the Doctor, then neither can she. So he ends up... The Doctor freed the child that was kind of creating energy for the planet and said, well, please destroy this planet make it so that this never happens again, to which she ends up being caught in the blast when the doctor, when the master redirects it. And yeah, but 
It's then revealed that Yaz managed to pilot the TARDIS while the Doctor was injured and get everyone get back home. To which he went, um, Croydon, them, but close enough. But I do like what they did with Yaz, ultimately, with her exit. Because I kind of felt like this was going to go in a sense of the Doctor saying, look, I don't want you to see this, I kind of have to do this alone. Or even... Even having her, having the Doctor regenerate and maybe seeing her as a man and Yaz, who we know had feelings for the Doctor, just going, you're not the woman I fell in love with, which I was kind of expecting. But anyway, I do like what they did with her, just allowing the Doctor and Yaz to have one last day together, one last date, going out for ice cream. You know what? That, that felt nice. And I will admit, the ending that they do give is very nice. I mean, as I said, I felt Dan Lewis was kind of sidelined throughout the entire thing. But after the Doctor drops Yaz off, she Yaz is met up by, once again, Graham and Dan, who tell her that, that they managed to arrange a small meeting with some of the Doctor's previous companions. And you know what? This is actually a very beautiful scene to see. I mean, even if they just managed to get these actors in for five minutes of their time, I was actually amazed they managed to do this. I mean, as Graham points out, I've had all these extraordinary things happen to me, and I can't tell anyone because, well, I think I'm mad. And it is nice to see. I mean, they managed to, they've got Kate Stewart in the room, they've got Graham, they've got Dan, they've got Yaz... But then they also have, they have Ace, they have Tegan, and then I guess that they went through the Doctor Who phone book cause, and got as many people back as they could, as among them is also Katie Manning's show Grant, who I don't believe actually has a line, just a chuckle, but yeah, it's still nice to see her again. Mel Bush, played once again by Bonnie Langford, and even they even managed to get back William Russell briefly as Ian Chesterton, who seems surprised that the Doctor is now a female, which, which was nice. I, I I didn't know if he'd ever come back to Doctor Who, but it's nice to see him back. But then, of course, having been injured, the Doctor does now have to regenerate, and there was one thing that people were already speculating about. They're effectively right on the internet. To which I was kind of hoping they weren't going to do this, but you know what? Seeing it still, it's still pretty cool. Which is that the Doctor arrives at the top of a cliff, she ends up going into a regeneration state, but something isn't quite right, as then her clothes seemingly change. She ends up in a slightly kind of battered suit and an overly blue coat, and then she realises, she recognises these teeth. As... The Doctor has seemingly degenerated once again, and is David Tennant. With the iconic phrase, what? 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 So, that's effectively it for Doctor Who now until the 60th anniversary, or until 2023 at least. And this is, of course, going to be a big story with David Tennant returning as the Doctor... Catherine Tate coming back as well. Neil Patrick Harris, who is rumoured is going to be the Celestial Toy Maker, although we'll see what role he's actually playing. And of course, the final appearance of the late Bernard Cribbins. Which, what are they going to store for us for the 60th or for 2023? Honestly, I can't wait to see. But as I said, the power of the Doctor, I'll admit it's mad. I'll admit it's mad. It's possibly a little disjointed. It's a little messy, but. If you don't have fun with this, you really need to re-examine yourself. So, there you go. There's my quite in-depth review of The Power of the Doctor. I'm sorry this review is a little longer than my normal ones, but the, there was just so much that I had to I had to redo it this way. Anyway, I really enjoyed it, but well, tell me what you think. Anyway, until the next Doctor, see ya.